Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone, my name is Carol Ng He. Uh, I'm the K-12 and Continuing Education Program Developer here at the Oriental Institute at the University. Um, Today I have the privilege to introduce you our last speaker of today's session, Roseanne Bouillot-Lazur, pardon my French pronunciation. Roseanne is a PhD candidate in Egyptology in the Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations Department of the University of Chicago. She was also guest curator at the Oriental Institute Museum for the special exhibit Between Heaven and Earth, Births Birds in Ancient Egypt, which ran last year um, between 2012 and 2013. After studying chemical engineering in France and completing an MA in Greek and Latin in Vermont, she is now able to combine her passion for birds and her academic interest in ancient Egypt. Her dissertation is entitled The Exploitation of Avian Resources in Ancient Egypt, a Social Economical Study. This summer, Roseanne is also teaching a three-week intensive high school course at the Oriental Institute through the Graham School of Liberal Studies on the topic Ancient Egyptian Language, Culture, and History. Please join me and welcome Roseanne. So, oh, it is already here. I see. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I do want to thank you all for being here and for coming to listen to me today. To listen to me today, and thank you, Andy and Carol, for inviting me. Uh, as Carol just uh, uh, mentioned, I am a PhD candidate here at the University uh, in Egyptology, and my uh, area of research is about birds, as uh, she mentioned as well. Uh, so what we are going to be talking about today is a little bit uh, out of my area of expertise, even though uh, the exploitation of birds is in one way a source of energy as well. Uh, but uh, my, my focus is mostly on seeing how the ancient Egyptians were able to take advantage of the huge resources uh, in birds that were visible every year during migration in the country. Uh, but it was very interesting for me actually to be asked to talk about uh, the energy uh, the way the ancient Egyptian perceived energy or used energy in their in their daily li da daily life sorry uh, I used to be a, a scientist myself, so those are topics. Actually, when I was a chemist, chemistry student, I wanted to uh, focus mostly on how we could preserve the environment, not so much being a polluter as a chemist, but more how we could find measures to prevent pollution. And it, eventually, I obviously switched field drastically <laughs> and ended up uh, in, in the humanities now, uh, because after all, I, ancient Egypt was my first passion. Uh, and uh, But in France, for those of you who are familiar with the system, you have to choose very early on what you want to study, and it's not always easy to uh, convince uh, teachers that uh, Egyptology is a worthwhile pursuit. So I ended up being a, a chemistry student, an engineering student, until I arrived to the US, and I realized I could switch. So I did it right away. Uh, um, I don't regret uh, studying science. So. But what is interesting for me now is to see actually how the ancient Egyptian uh, dealt with the environment around them. And that's why birds is really a wonderful way for me to uh, combine both interests. Uh, they were very much impacted by everything that surrounded them, obviously. And I wanted to see how we could see it in their uh, art, their literature. And, and uh, especially because the ancient Egyptian believes that there had to be a certain balance in the universe. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with the concept of ma'at. So everything had to be at a certain, uh, under a certain balance. And it was the uh, pharaoh's uh, duty, actually, as ruler of the country to maintain that balance. Uh, so it would be interesting now to see if the ancient Egyptians, in the way they used uh, the environment or took advantage of the environment and the resources they had around them, if they were able to maintain that balance. So we can perhaps talk about that afterwards. You can tell me what you think about this. Uh, what about the sources of energy? So when I think of sources of energy today, I mostly think of fossil fuel. But it's really what we use most more often than not. It's going to be uh, gas, oil, uh, natural gas. Uh, or coal or nuclear power as well. Obviously, none of that was available to the ancient Egyptians. Uh, 
Uh, but one of them, some of the, some of the one you see listed here are very basic, and I, I have to admit, at first I take them for granted. I don't necessarily think of them as being sources of of energy. But the sun, after all, is indispensable. Uh, all living things need the sun, most of them. There are some that live in the middle of cave if, uh, and they don't need light, but let's say they are the exception, really. But most living things need light, and they also need water for the most part. And thanks to the sun and water, you get plant growth, and trees are going to be growing as well. This is what will be more important in what I'm going to be talking about later. Uh, all those plants and uh, allow people and uh, animals to thrive as well. So they're able to actually fulfill their function and do some work. And finally, the wind as well is uh, important as a, as a source of uh, energy for the ancient Egyptian. And we'll talk about that in a second. So thanks to all those sources of energy I just mentioned, so people, were, people and animals were able to, uh, to survive and thrive in, ancient, in, in Egypt. Uh, energy would also provide heat to cook and to stay warm because Egypt, even though it's in the middle of the mostly desert, as we'll see uh, in a minute, it, it, is, it does get chilly actually in the winter, so being able to stay warm is a good thing. Light was also necessary mostly for those who worked, the workers in the mines or those who were uh, excavating all those tombs for uh, the elite and the, and the pharaohs, they needed to have source, a source of light. Uh, building project, everybody knows of those wonderful uh, monuments that the ancient Egyptian built. So that was uh, definitely uh, a major, uh, a lot of energy was needed to be able to build all those wonderful temples and pyramids. Uh, uh, the ancient Egyptians were actually very proficient at some, uh, some industry, we'll see that, and those industries also required quite a bit of fuel. And transportation as well uh, is a uh, is, uh, is one of the uh, consumer of, of energy. Uh, just a brief, brief uh, review where Egypt is located. So northeast corner of uh, Africa essentially acts as a bridge towards uh, between Africa and Asia. And when you see on that uh, satellite image, there is um, in the country itself, uh, one color really is dominating. That's that brown color. So mostly really 96% of Egypt is desert. Uh, the western, eastern desert, and the Sinai, and just a tiny, tiny bit of the country really is green. And it's all around the Nile River, the Nile Delta, and the Nile Valley. Uh, so if you didn't have the, uh, Ni the river itself, there would be no civilization. And perhaps uh, you have heard uh, the quote by Herodotus from his book, The History, that uh, Egypt is a gift of the river, which means the Nile. And it is true, everything depends uh, on the Nile River. So, oops, there we go, okay, for next, here we go. So until recently, uh, Egypt would see every year the uh, flood, uh, the river would actually overflow its uh, usual bed and cover the flood base and the agricultural plain, but that's, uh, oh, by the way, I should say, if you have any question at any time, please, you can interrupt me because I, I would be delighted if you have something that you want to ask right away, do so. And I might actually ask questions as well. Since I'm teaching right now, I am, and you guys are all teachers, I'm sure you understand, sometimes you can't help, you have to ask a question to the audience. Uh, so uh, till the building of the Aswa, High Aswan Dam, which was completed in 1970, uh, the entire country, the floodplain would be covered. Uh, the Nile would start uh, rising towards the, moons, the months of June uh, till about August, and then it would start to slowly, re uh, slowly recede. Uh, that uh, flood water was extremely important. Uh, it, the, most of the water is coming from the mountains of Ethiopia and would be filled with nutrient and silt. Uh, and as it would recede slowly, the nutrients would be deposited uh, in the agricultural plant and that would allow for the fertility to be, all the food needed by the plant to be brought back to the land. Uh, and here you have some of the examples, a few, the, la the last pictures of the country with the flood in the 1960s. Nowadays, obviously, the Nile still floods, but the, uh, because of the dam, all the additional water that uh, flows in the, in the summer is actually retained in Lake Nasser and is slowly, uh, uh, diver um, slowly flows into the Nile in Egypt so that the, uh, the level is about always the same and the Egyptian can have agriculture all year long. Uh, but for the ancient Egyptian, that was obviously a crucial, crucial moment in the year. And actually that's when they would start the year. The first day of the year was when the flood started. 
so as I mentioned, we have very, very, very abrupt uh, uh, a border between the uh, a fertile plain and the desert. And actually you could just uh, step, on one side you would be in the agricultural plain, on the other side you wouldn't be in the desert. It's really that abrupt, which is very interesting. If you've had a chance to go to Egypt, it's really the drastic difference between the two. And nowadays, because of the population explosion, there are more and more people living in Egypt. They always try uh, to get more and more uh, agricultural land uh, crouching and crouching in the desert. Uh, so some of uh, actually what the ancient Egyptian would have had was desert at the time. Uh, what, what is now agricultural plan where it was desert for, for them. And this is more or less how it worked. The, uh, the, flood, uh, the flood, the Nile ba basin it has a convex shape. So essentially at the very edges of the Nile, you would have levees uh, on which most of the villages would be uh, located because obviously you don't want your village to be destroyed every year. So you would be placed uh, in an area where the, the water would not, uh, would not destroy your, your, your houses every year. So that's mostly the levees at the very edge of the flood of the river. And, but they would dig some sort of canal so that the flood, the river, could actually flow into those basins. Uh, and then they would be able to control exactly with some dikes and dams, et cetera, uh, where the water would exactly go so they could uh, really uh, use the resources of the Nile as much as possible. They were also able to take advantage of the water in the Nile if there was not enough in the field by using some very basic tools. Uh, the uh, the um, shadows that you see up at the uh, at the top is still used today, actually. It's a very, very, very simple uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, you have an arm on one side, a bucket that you, uh, you dip into, uh, into, your, uh, into your water, and on the other side, a, a counterweight. And they still use it today. And eventually, uh, we have a presentation of this mechanism starting in the New Kingdom, which is about 1500 BC. Uh, we know also uh, during the Ptolemaic period, so when the Macedonian, the Greek, are ruling the country, uh, we know of a more complex mechanism, which is essentially an animal-powered water wheel uh, that you see at the bottom right here, uh, where it's actually an animal who do, who that does the work. And it's uh, by, with a system of very simple gears, there will be a wheel with little pots attached to it that will go into the water, and eventually you can take your pot that will be filled with water. Agriculture, that was the main function of most of the people in the, uh, in the countries, was to produce the food that would be, uh, so would be used to feed everybody uh, in the country, in particular those that were not involved in the food production. Uh, when uh, there was enough, uh, when there was enough, at the end, when the state was created around 3000 BC, and uh, the ruler was able to uh, have full control over the population, so to speak, the whole country. There was, a part, uh, there was a portion of the population that was taken aside, essentially, and specialized into some crafts. Those people not involved in uh, food production had to be fed, uh, so the uh, rest of the population was involved in producing food for everybody, in, in, uh, including those craftsmen, and also they would uh, produce a surplus that was used for trade. Uh, here we have, actually the, Egypt the Egyptologists are very lucky because we have a, at our disposal some incredible scenes. The ancient Egyptian, uh, the members of the upper elite would cover the walls of their tombs with uh, multiple scenes, what we call scenes of daily life. Uh, we have to be careful when we uh, look at them because the goal was not to represent exactly daily life, more an ideal situation that you would want to keep as a record for your afterlife. At the same time, it gives you an idea of, uh, gives you a glimpse of what some of the activities of the rest of the population, the farmers, the working community uh, was like. So here we actually have some wonderful examples of the farming, uh, the farmers at work. Uh, you have, let me find, where is my, here it is. Uh, so here, here we have the tomb owner uh, who is supervising some of the activities taking place in his field. So we have people cutting, w cutting wheat here, it's winnowing, and here threshing of the grain. And uh, another noble around the same time, so you recognize the style is very similar. Uh, probably the same artist involved in both tombs, but it's the same activities taking place. And uh, Mr. Nacht here is checking things in the shade and sitting while everybody else is working. Uh, so this is just wonderful, wonderful little uh, snapshot of what may have been taking place in, in, uh, in the countryside. 
I mentioned that wind was, uh, was one of the sources of power, or energy rather, in ancient Egypt. Uh, and it was used mostly for transport because uh, the Nile River, while it was crucial for the water supply for the agricultural uh, community, it was also uh, the main artery for transport. Uh, they would use it uh, mostly. There was, there was no real incentive to develop a road system all along the Nile Valley when you could just hop on a boat and uh, travel this way. And it was very convenient because uh, what's special about the Nile Valley, the Nile River, is that it flows from the south to the north, which is unusual, longest river in the world, uh, and it flows from the south to the north. So if you wanted, you lived in Thebes, for example, in Aswan, you need to go to Cairo, oh, not Cairo, because it didn't exist, Memphis, uh, you could just hop on a boat, and the, de the determinative they would use in the words, or the hieroglyph they would use to, to indicate that action, did not have its cell deployed, so you see it right here. However, if you wanted to go the other way, you wanted to go from Memphis to Thebes, you would still hop on your boat, but this time you would take advantage of the winds which are uh, um, blowing from the north to the south, and then you would use your cell. So then that's when the wind was actually very important for travel. So the boats are actually, we see representation of boats from the very, very beginning uh, of Egyptian even prehistory, some of the first representation were actually boats. And it looks as if being able to have a boat was one way for the ancient Egyptian to show their power over the rest of the community. If you have a boat, you can travel, you can go from village one to village B, and you might be able to actually rule a bigger, bigger piece of land. Uh, uh, boats were used to transport not just people, but a lot of goods was transported that way, even major, major, uh, pieces of uh, sculpture, like here you have a representation at the top of an obelisk. Uh, that's a representation from the temple of Del Bahri by Achepsut in Thebes, where she, she's famous for uh, obelisks, and she, here she is so proud of it that she wants uh, to have it recorded on her, on her mortuary temple. So you see it on the top being transported uh, to go to it, to wherever final location is going to be. And at the bottom, you see that's one of the typical scenes that we see in the tombs of the Old Kingdom, so let's say around 2400 BC, 20, 2300 BC, where you have the tomb owner standing on a small boat. It's very big. For those of you who are familiar with Egyptian art size, the bigger you are, the more important you are. So obviously, this is not an idea of uh, it was so much bigger than uh, all these workers. These workers are very tiny little guys. But you can see them also uh, on a variety of boats transporting some of the good that they had acquired in the marshes uh, of Egypt. But at the end of the day, who was doing most of the work? It was really, uh, they used muscle work. And, and we'll start with, uh, with the animals. So they did have at their disposal some traction animals, in particular uh, cattle. Cattle, the oxen were actually probably first domesticated in Egypt, in southern, a little bit southern part of uh, Egypt, just a little bit south of Egypt, but not Playa, they have evidence of domesticated cattle already around 8,000 BC. But donkeys were brought from the Levant, and so they were, so you can see that at the very bottom, a representation of once again farming in the countryside by the, by the Nile by the Nile River, and uh, cattle, the cows of different colors and spots that didn't like monotony, the Egyptian artists, so they always added those little touches, which I like very much. Uh, so the cattle is uh, taking care of pulling the plow. Uh, in the other representation from uh, a tomb from about 2,000 year, uh, years earlier, you see donkeys uh, being used to carry loads, but also to thresh, uh, as thre to thresh the, the wheat to separate the grain from, from, the, ch from the chaff. Le, le horses uh, that we, we perhaps take them for granted, but they were not in Egypt all the time. Actually, they only came uh, uh, rather about uh, uh, 1,500 years after the formation of the state. They're coming from the Levant. Uh, they were introduced by some one group of rulers who came from the Levant. And that's when, uh, after the New Kingdom, we start seeing the king, for example, in his chariot, very victorious. That's only later in history, before that. Uh, the king is usually represented sitting, but it's uh, King Victorious on his chariot, only comes after the New Kingdom and those horses brought from the Levant. And so they were mostly uh, animals reserved for the elite. They were expensive animals. Donkeys would be what everybody, the people who could afford it, well, it was easier to afford a donkey. Horses are not very commonly referred to in texts, but they were present. And of course, people, 
uh, the uh, uh, the king of Egypt, uh, is, in theory, uh, was able to call upon anybody to work for him. Uh, so most of the population, really, 90 plus percent of the population was involved in fruit production, as I mentioned uh, earlier. But they could be called upon at any time for core of their labor, for work, for work that needed to be done uh, in service of the state. Uh, so they will be called for a monumental building project. We'll talk a little bit more in a minute. But also all the irrigation canals, uh, the levees that had to be repaired, that was crucial for their own, uh, for, 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 them, for their own work anyway. So they were definitely in, regularly involved in those. Uh, mining expedition as well, and military campaigns. So I said, in theory, everybody could be called, but there were exemptions. So if you worked in a temple, uh, you, you probably will not have to do that type of work. Or also, if you're rich enough, you can always have somebody else do the work for you. Uh, and we know of that, uh, if, if, I don't know if you're familiar with those little figurines that were found in tombs called the Shaptis. Uh, they have on, actually written on them, uh, they are little figures that in, we think in the afterlife, after you're dead, they will do all the work for you. And they mention specifically what type of work. And a lot of the work is related to agricultural activity. So that's how it gives us an idea of some of the uh, uh, core labor that was asked for from people. And here to give you an idea, this is an amazing, this is kind of a unique scene as well. It gives you an idea of the number of people, the, uh, the members. This is actually not the king. This is a, a scene from a tomb of a, uh, what we call a nomarch. So that's a local official in, uh, in the provinces outside of the, the capital. And that's his statue that he wants transporting. He has a seated statue that was uh, made for him. Uh, and he has 170 plus people, I think, being gathered together to be able to pull it. So that gives you an idea of uh, the number of people that could be summoned to work for you if you needed uh, work done uh, uh, on your, in your estate. And because I'm talking about ancient Egypt, I of course have to talk about the pyramids. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that uh, there was a time we said the pyramids were built by slaves. I'm sorry to say, but that is not true. Uh, there were a lot of people involved, that is true. There would be more than uh, perhaps 25,000 people working at the site at a given time. But it was not the same people all the time. They would work for three month rotation, that's what we think. And those were mostly skilled workers. Those pyramids are so well built that obviously the people involved, they knew what they were doing. Uh, we had very, very proficient masons, uh, stone cutters. Uh, architect, I guess, if we want to call them that way, that sounds very modern, but they were really very skilled. But they did have labor to help them, and they have estimated, uh, I don't, uh, perhaps you've seen on TV, because he's been on TV many times, Mark Lenner. He's actually a research associate at the Oriental Institute, and he's been uh, working on the Giza Plateau for the past, mm, I don't want to be mean, perhaps 30 years? He's been working there for a long time, and uh, he has uh, discovered in the 1990s, actually, where those workers used to live. Uh, and he has estimated what I have uh, in color right here, actually, it looks as if they were, they are very, it's a very interesting building, it's very long galleries, and they have assumed that that might be where people actually would be living, the, labor, the laborers that would come for a short period of time. And he has estimated perhaps 2,000 non-unskilled laborers would come and do some of the heavy duty work that did not require necessarily any skill. And in those buildings, so that's how they might be sleeping, uh, so very crowded, uh, not necessarily the best uh, living condition, but when you were working for the state, you would get free food and free lodging, so you take what you can, I guess, you're not being picky. Uh, but 40 to 50 people could be living in those. And especially during the flood, the agricultural community couldn't work. So that was one way for them to use their time, so to speak, is to do some, to work on those monumental projects. I also mentioned mining expeditions. Even though we know that later on, those would be reserved, essentially those jobs would be reserved for the uh, criminals and the prisoners because the conditions were really, really difficult. But what is wonderful about Egypt, once again, uh, the climate might be very, uh, it's very dry, it's a hyper arid climate, and we have a lot of organic material that has survived, in particular of papyri. And you don't see perhaps too well here, take my word for it, this is actually a map, one of the f oldest uh, uh, topographical map. Uh, it's a map of the Eastern Desert, uh, of the gold mines of a uh, region called uh, Wadi Amamat uh, in the Eastern Desert. It's an area that uh, connects the uh, Nile Valley around the uh, Coptos to go toward the Red Sea. And you have the location of the 
uh, gold mine and also some quarries of a speci specific type of stone that they were very fond of. The Eastern Desert is filled with uh, natural resources such as very fancy stone that the Egyptian like, the pharaohs like for their statues, but also uh, mineral ores such as gold or copper. Uh, so we are aware of many, many mines that were being exploited at the time. And I had to put some of the beautiful uh, gold uh, artifacts that has, this is not tut. Usually people always think of tut, but this is not tut. There, were, there was another mask discovered. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the tomb of Tanis. That were, they were, those tombs were actually, actually unplundered and discovered just at the beginning of the World War II, so they didn't make as much, uh, as much noise, so to speak, as the, the tombs of King Tut, but those were unplundered with some beautiful uh, uh, artifacts as well. Because I mentioned uh, uh, metals, so that means metallurgy, that means a lot of fuel. So I'm going to start, about, to start talking about the sources of fuel in ancient Egypt. For most of the ancient world, really, wood was the main source of, uh, of fuel. You see here, actually, once again, those very nice little vignettes uh, from tombs where you see people actually involved in cutting wood uh, along, the Nile, along the Nile River for the most part. For the top representation, you can see actually what the, the wood is going to be used for. It's actually not fuel, but it's actually a boat. Uh, you can see the boat being built a little bit further. Uh, and underneath, it's, uh, it's uh, the same scene that you've seen before, where there are so many activities taking place. Egypt is rich in many things, but not wood, because it is, uh, it is located in mostly a desertic area. There are not a lot of uh, uh, wood growing in the, in the country. And a lot of it, especially the, if you wanted big, tall trees for pillars or for parts of your building, you had to import it. And the most famous one is the one from, uh, from Lebanon, from Biblos. Uh, they would go and get cedars, big cedar trees. And most of the, if you wanted also a very fancy coffin, uh, you would get cedar from Lebanon. Otherwise, the poor people, those who could not afford, would get local wood, but that was not as fancy. They would, we also have evidence that they were aware that you could get, you could actually make charcoal, which is a, a, a not completely oxidized wood, but that has much more uh, calorific value. So you, it's doubly, uh, twice as effective as wood, essentially, to produce heat, heat, sorry, but it's also lighter. So if you had to transport it, it's much, much more convenient to do so. And we have evidence of charcoal being used in ancient Egypt uh, as early as the pre-dynastic. However, I have to say something about that part. As I said, this was something I, uh, I had to research a lot for you guys today, and I was very disappointed because I couldn't find a lot of information about this very topic. People have not, for when it comes to Egypt, ancient Egypt, it has not been studied. People have not really focused their attention so far on those type of, uh, of remains in, uh, in archaeological setting. Very often, sometimes, that's going to be something that will be disregarded. And it was very difficult, actually, for me to get good information, good data on the type of fuel that was used, how much fuel, and a lot has been done on Rome, for example. So I would say, if you guys wanted to do some projects, you could uh, definitely, I think it would be very interesting to do that type of uh, research and figure out, OK, I have 25,000 people at, on the plateau of Giza. How many, how many, they, what they need to eat? How much food do they need? How, how much, like if you, and I'll talk about that actually right now. Uh, if you need to feed all those people, uh, what are you going, how much fuel will you need for that? Uh, you, bread, bread and beer was essentially the main staple of, of uh, Egyptian uh, cuisine. Uh, and the people would be paid in grain for the most part. Uh, and people, when they worked at the Giza Plateau, were fed. So you had to feed 25,000 people every day for all year long. And it took for the pyramid of Khufu, so the largest one, the first one, it took 23 or 27, I can never remember. But it took a few years to put it together. It's quite remarkable considering how big it is, but still. So that means it, you need a lot of wood to be able to, to keep your bakery going. My father was a baker. I've seen what it was to, put, to take care of uh, bread every day. And here we're talking about an awful lot. So here is another of, of the representation from one of the tomb to give you an idea of how they baked bread. And those type of uh, bell-shaped mold are extremely common uh, throughout Egyptian history. And at, in Giza, they found hundreds of thousands of fragments of them. Uh, they also uncovered one of the 
these industrial, industrial bakeries where they found lots of ashes. But once again, I didn't get any more information about it. It looks as if the wood was coming from nearby. So, so when they, uh, in um, some areas, they have actually studied qualitatively the wood. And it looks as if they were especially using uh, trees that would be found along the Nile Valley, so local wood. Uh, I, don't, I couldn't find information about the way how they make charcoal. It's still a process that has not been studied for Egypt. The picture that I show you is what they, how they do it today. Uh, but I, when it came to the ancient times, I'm not exactly sure. But here they tried to reproduce some of the baking processes, and they were using charcoal for their experiment. Another case study where they, that, where they only qualitatively studied the charcoal, but not quantitatively. The Ramaseum is also a very interesting location. Uh, during the New Kingdom, so uh, Ramaseum is a mortuary temple of uh, Ramses II, Ramses the Great, so around, let's say, 20, uh, 1250 BC. Uh, his mortuary temple is not just a temple, but it's also surrounded by huge uh, magazines that would be filled with grain and all sorts of, mostly grain in particular, that would be used to actually feed uh, the workers, all the people working uh, in, in the region. Um, and actually, we have, uh, from that period, a little bit later, some of the first strike papyri as well, because they were, the workers were not being paid, so they went to the to the Ramaseum and complain and say, give me my food. Uh, so what, that's why you see those long rooms that they were, would have been filled with, uh, with grain and other goods. So the, the archaeologists were able to gather some fragment of charcoal, uh, and they identify, as I wrote here, nine type of trees, but most of them are actually local trees growing along the Navale. So it looks as if they were gathering their fuel uh, close by. Uh, it's also possible that the charcoal itself was produced close by, but it's not been studied yet. Metallurgy. If kitchen and bakeries were using a lot of fuel, it's nothing in comparison with metallurgy. So we, I mentioned earlier years that there were quite a few uh, uh, mines, a lot of mines actually, uh, 90 plus just for gold in the Eastern Desert, but there was also copper, silver, just a tiny bit of iron. Iron was not very much used in ancient Egypt, but it, it might have been in some other part of the Near East. Copper and gold were, and bronze eventually when tin was, uh, was brought into the picture. Uh, bronze where the metals are used, they use more often than not. But the Sinai was also a rich area in copper and the Sinai was, has been exploited even pre-Egyptian uh, state, so pr during the pre-dynastic period, let's say 3500 BC, the uh, so the people living in the Nile Valley were actually traveling already to the Sinai to, ex to, uh, to work the go to copper mine. And recently, uh, a French team actually led by uh, Professor Pierre Talley has, been, uh, has discovered the, uh, my, uh, mines in all the smelting uh, areas uh, of in that part in that region of, uh, of the Sinai that you see as Serabid El Kadim that's indica indicated on the map. He has found, in particular, uh, a battery of 3,000 furnaces. Uh, so theoretically, all those furnaces would have been working at the same time, smelting copper, uh, copper ores. Uh, so where does the wood come from? Because when I show you the pictures where this is located, rather, rather uh, desertic, not much vegetation. So I con actually contacted Professor Talley because that bothered me. <laughs> I said, where did they get all their wood, all their fuel? Uh, they, yeah, they assumed that charcoal was used because charcoal is better at maintaining the very high temperature that you need for smelting ores. Uh, for copper, it's around 1100, I think, degrees Celsius, and you need to maintain it for a certain time to be able to separate the metal from all the slag. So they don't know. The, the, the easy answer is they don't know exactly where it comes from. They assume that it must have been obtained locally. Uh, but that's, we're talking huge, huge quantity of fuel. So it is possible that the uh, area of the Sinai uh, around 2500 BC, which is around the time when it was used extensively, uh, was much more, a much more wooded area. Uh, the climate was more propitious for uh, tree growth. Uh, this is a possibility. It is also possible that the Egyptians actually used up all the wood resources of the area and stopped using it when 
uh, there was no more wood. It's, we don't know. There has been a lot of talk about deforestation during Roman time because the Roman were building ships galore and they used a lot of wood as well. And so they, the, the Roman having such a huge empire with some of the, that area very wooded, people have done a lot of research, but not so much on Egypt yet. So that's something else that could be very interesting to look more into. And I'm sure Professor Tale is going to spend more time identifying it. It is clear from the documentation that uh, wood was important because it was recorded. Uh, we do know uh, that, for example, at the, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, Thebes and the uh, village uh, of Dera Medina, where all the people building the tombs for the kings were housed, uh, we have actually documents saying how much wood was being brought to them for fuel specifically, not just wood for building whatever or making something, but for fuel. So it is definitely a uh, commodity that was taken very seriously and that they kept, they kept their eye on. Uh, we also know that temples uh, where, where they were making sure to to grow a lot of trees so they would have special garden. The way it's represented, you can see they're bringing dirt essentially. Uh, from the Nile Valley to be able to grow the trees because temples are mostly built in the dry in the desert. So they're trying, they're trying hard to build the, to have trees, but it seems to be that it's still something that they don't have very much of. Fuel were also needed because they were very good at making beautiful pottery. I'm very fond, as you can see, everything that's uh, uh, Egyptian craftsmen were really uh, talented. Pottery and faience and also glass. Uh, this all come from the New Kingdom, the reign of Amenhotep III. He was the best when it comes to uh, minor arts. Uh, he lived during a very prosperous time and he really dedicated all the resources that he got from the entire empire of Egypt to making beautiful things. So it's quite a remarkable. Well, the glass especially is quite something. But that also needed, they also needed a lot of fuel for that. So lots of trees that had to be cut and I'm not sure where they come from. So I'm, I'm making a huge leap in time now. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about something that's completely new that you don't see before at all. Uh, those type of public facility uh, where the Romans were very fond of bath. The, and when they settled in Egypt, they brought those facilities with them. Um, we, uh, we know that they were actually mostly, what we have documents for, especially they have found a, no, a large collection of texts from the Theban region. Uh, we, we know that they were, for the soldiers, they were quite large garrison, uh, large Roman camps in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, during the Roman period, no more pharaohs in Egypt. You still had them during the Greek, uh, the Ptolemaic period, but not for the Romans, because uh, Egypt at that point is only a uh, province. It's not... Uh, it's not uh, ruled by a Roman pharaoh like you would have before with the Ptolemies. So they would be uh, garrisons, Roman soldiers being sent there, and they would want their bath as well. So we have found actually remains of uh, bathhouses all along the Nile Valley, but also in fortresses that would have been built in the desert. So for the, uh, we also have record of the type of fuel because they recorded that as well. And we know that mostly what they used was uh, straw at that point. They talk about straw and it's also specific straw. It's straw for the bath. So whatever they used, I guess straw could also be used to, for the animals, but they were, the garrison were being delivered special straw that would be used to, uh, to heat up the bath. So those baths are special in that they use a hippocost, I'm not sure how you pronounced it, People coast uh, a system, which is a, a, a system that uh, you have a furnace that you heat up with tons of fuel and then that warms up the air that will make your nice bath nice and warm. Uh, and also some, eventually there was a new um, innovation. They also made holes in the walls so that the warm air could also go up the wall so your, your room were really nice and pleasant for you to be if you're having your bath. Uh, so we know they use straw uh, for the uh, uh, fortresses that were in the desert where they might not have been so much supplies. We know they used animal dung from their donkeys, from their horses, from their camels, whatever animals. They would dry it and then eventually use it as fuel. Uh, so they took whatever they had at their disposal at that point. But what about, so I'm now, I'm also jumping topic a little bit, but uh, about the Industrial Revolution, because that changed the world uh, at the, uh, in the 18th century uh, in England uh, with the arrival of the steam, the steam engine. And well, you'll be surprised to hear that that concept actually had already been thought about by the uh, Greek 
uh, scholars during the Hellenistic period, uh, we do have the record from a gentleman called Hero of Alexandria living during the second century AD. Uh, no, second half of the first century CE, so actually not during the beginning of the Roman, em the Roman Empire. Uh, Alexandria was essentially the center for science or knowledge at the time with the big, uh, the museum, the big library. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, scholars would actually go there. There was, at the time, really an interest in science for the sake of science, so pure knowledge, theoretical knowledge, which was not the case for the Egyptian. The Egyptian perhaps were not so innovative because they're, if they invented something, it had to have a pragmatic use. It had to be used right away. When the, with the Greek, when they came, there was an uh, interest of knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Uh, so apparently, those gentlemen were studying the movement of air, compression. They thought about the, the use of the, um, I cannot find the way, the, uh, that when you push, um, ah. Anyway, that's okay. But he also thought about in the pneumatica, so it's all about air, the movement of air, and compressed air, that if you were to heat up air, eventually you, in a machine that was closed, uh, if I understand how that machine works, so you heat up some water, eventually you get steam. The steam goes through those two, two rods here, goes into the bowl, and because the power of the steam will make the ball rotates. That was the idea. So essentially, he had thought about the fact that steam had some sort of energy that you could use uh, in a machine. However, that was not exploited more than that. That was just a thought, actually. And people nowadays, researchers are wondering, why didn't they go any further? Because they devised tons of new uh, machines and uh, technology. Why didn't they use the steam engine any further, and why did we have to wait until the 18th century England for it to actually be fully exploited? So that could be something to think about as well, because uh, according to that article, you needed more than just the idea of the steam engine for it to go further. But that could be something of interest, I think, for students. And I'm going to stop. That, that was a very quick, obviously, presentation of uh, energy and fuel in ancient Egypt. But uh, it is interesting for me. When I st as soon as I started, because I'm so interested in the environment, it is clear that as soon as the Egyptians settled along the Nile Valley, they right away changed the landscape. Because as soon as they settled, agriculture was developed. They changed the, the flood plain uh, to make it uh, to turn it into wheat fields. Uh, they had grazing animals, obviously they modify their environment. Obviously it was slow pace at the beginning. As population grew, the flood plain, the wild flood plain would disappear, would get smaller and smaller. And uh, so, but it was still a very slow process, not like today where things are going very fast in Egypt. Uh, but they were very much reliant on their on their environment entirely for their survival, especially when you think about it, all they have is the Nile Valley. Everything else is more or less, it's not devoid of life, but there are not a lot that they can do with for survival. Uh, so they were mostly self-sufficient, except for the wood, really, that they had to go elsewhere. But I didn't mention it before, because that could be a topic all in itself. Religion in ancient Egypt is also um, aspect of daily life, everything has a religious aspect to it. It's part of everything they do. And because it was so crucial to their life, those important uh, natural resources and natural elements around them were actually deified. I'm sure you all know the sun god, Re, uh, but you also have the god of the Nile River, the god Happy, which is right here. Oops, right here, that's Happy, the god of, uh, of the river Nile, that was very much worshipped as well because they wanted to make sure that he was going to give a good flood every year. And that was actually the job of Pharaoh, to make sure that as a good Pharaoh, he should have made sure that the flood was good. And if the flood was not good, usually that was bad for Pharaoh. Pharaoh would get in trouble, so to speak. Uh, and also the tree goddess was crucial for them too. So we see her represented very much later in Egyptian, uh, Egyptian art, but she's part of the, sea, of the scenes in the tomb where she's feeding people. Uh, so I'm just wondering, do you think, that's for you to that open the question because I don't necessarily have an answer, but do you think that because they had such, religious, uh, uh, such a religious connection with the environment, do you think that they were more respectful of it? Uh, can we talk about sustainability, which is a big a buzzword today, uh, sustainability. Do you think they were sustainable? They were thinking about how to preserve the environment for their own survival. Uh, those are the type of questions that are, I think, very interesting and definitely worth discussing. 
uh, but uh, I don't necessarily expect an answer right now, but if I have something to think about. Uh, and I thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, please. Thank you. That was really, really fascinating. Oh, um, thank but you. But I, I also just wanted to ask kind of a couple of mundane questions. And one was, please. so the uh, Hellenistic um, reference that you had to steam engines, was that sort of a simple turbine then that, that they had created? It looks as if, yes, that's a good word, turbine. I guess from what I understand, because I, I, I may have been an engineer at some point in my life, but that's a long time ago, and I figure, <laughs> oh, guys, they talk, it's, it's a simple the steam engine, I'll take your, but I guess that's what it is. That's, that's a simple turbine that he had been able to devise, and that's in his work, very simply described, apparently. Hero of Alexandria described it in his work, and that's about all I can tell you. So is anyone recreating these machines? I think so. I think people, because some of the drawings that you see are not the drawing from uh, his book, but some uh, scholars later, during the Enlightenment period and later, were very interesting when they rediscovered the work of those Hellenistic scholars. So, oh, that guy, that's probably what he was talking about. It would be interesting, actually, to go back and see that book. Perhaps not read it in Greek, but uh, try to see how it was presented, because I doubt that he had drawings, but I don't know, I have not looked at it personally. And then the second yes. question was, um, how do you actually make charcoal now that they might be modeling how they made it then? Is it just burning the... So uh, there are, from what I understand, because there are a bunch of ways to make charcoal, uh, you have, so you make your big pile, you don't want your, your, your uh, wood to be fully uh, oxidized, fully burnt. So it's a, it's a slowly, you burn it very slowly, and I don't know how you control it, but eventually you, you get it. To, somebody knows, perhaps. Somebody in the audience might know how to make charcoal. I wouldn't. Oh, okay. That could be, because that's a very good question. I need to look more into it. I, I did not study more the because some people, like in England, there, is, there was a lot in the documentation of, oh, yes. It's a fascinating process. <laughs> and it was, it was one of our leading energy sources in our early history, certainly yeah, exactly. in the United States. But you, basically, you take greener wood works better, and you pile it all up, and then you cover it with, dirt, um, with duff. Yeah, with yeah. dirt, yeah. and then you very slowly let it burn. But it takes weeks, it, you know, maybe a couple weeks for a big mound of it. So colliers, that the word a collie dog was originally part of the collier's dog. Anyway, a collier is a person who does this. So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Well, how do you know when it's finished? Uh, you ask the dog. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I apologize because I guess I should know. But this is something I, I will have to look more into myself because this is interesting. Uh, I, I'm curious myself. It's those big, huge piles. So yeah, they, would, uh, they would smoke a little bit. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, exactly. That's what it is, yeah, it's, it's, that's true. There you go. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, you did have that. You were showing the dikes and all that. Yep. So with uh, the irrigation dikes and uh, what they did with, uh, to, to control the floodplain, uh, how did they handle the siltation uh, problems? I mean, the, the buildup of silt. Would they have to like take that and spread it about, or? or? I, th I think, from what I, from, I don't. I think that's what they wanted. They wanted the silt because of uh, currently the silt. They called the Egypt, the not only the black land, the Kemet, the black land. So I think this was just very rich nutrient, filled with nutrient, and not just clay or something that you would want to get rid of. Uh, it looks like it, it would actually be in the ditches. You'd have to get it out of the ditches and spread it about. Did they? Well, the, they would have to thin them up. So that was part of the low score of the labor. But the one that would be, you talking about the one in the, in the, in the canals in particular? Or uh, the one that would be in the fields? Well, um, because it would be everywhere, I guess. Because you're right, in the canals, we do have documentation that they would regularly have to clean them up because it okay. would be, you're right, they would, be they would eventually get filled. Uh, if they wanted the water to be spread evenly, they would have to clean them up regularly. And it's something you still have to do today uh, for their irrigation. In the field, were you wondering about the, what, how it was in the field as well? 
Well, I would assume it'd be a similar process because it in was both just case, very slowly. Getting... Uh, from what I understand, because I, that's what I, I regret the most, I think, is to not have witnessed the flood. Uh -huh. uh, it's been an obviously a long. I was not born yet when that was uh, that ended, and um, I just would have liked to see actually how the fields were right afterwards, right after, because. It, it would stay stagnant uh, for a little while before it would recede very slowly. Mm -hmm. So everything at the time to very slowly deposit. And you would not have problem of salinization in Egypt like you might have in some other areas because even though it's very dry, uh, it would not evaporate very quickly. So whatever minerals you might have in the, in the water would not have the time to just get that, become a crust or whatever on top of the, of the land, which is a problem now, actually, that they didn't used to have because before all those minerals, the water being on the field for so long would just get into the, get into the ground and would not just stay on the surface. Okay. But, but a lot of what we know about all those have disappeared, all the canal, the ancient canal, the ancient uh, ditches that they would have built has obviously disappeared because all the available land has been reclaimed and more now. So it's a lot of hypothetical uh, work that has been done by people who are specialized really on water was a big deal. Actually, there were water rights uh, also that people talk about in some documents. I'm not sure exactly like some temples would have access to water, which I don't understand, or would have the right for water. Uh, and also what was interesting is every single year they would have to remeasure fields because everything would disappear essentially during the flood. So you have a presentation of somebody uh, going and measuring field to, to reclaim the boundaries every single year. So, uh, so that's the type of thing we rely on the representation. We have tidbits from the, from the texts, but the whole process is a lot of recreation. What we think would work also based on what we might have seen earlier on, on ethnographic work. Uh, is it exactly what took place in Egypt? I'm not sure. But we do know they would have to go and dry, uh, dredge, is that the word? Dredge the canals and the ditches because the silt, as, you, as you're very correct, would accumulate. Any other questions? Uh, I have a right. question for you, and I wanted to take your bait uh, on the sustainability issue. So I'm somewhat embarrassed to say, despite being taught this in grade school, I was probably at least 30 years old when I first realized how profound a technology flour and grain was. That is, flour allowed the storage of food across time and space. You could eat in winter. Uh, you could pack it on a beast of burden and travel far distances and still be able to bake bread. Uh, how it allowed population growth, civilization, so on and so forth. And obviously, the flooding of the Nile allowed for the uh, emergence of agriculture in Egypt and led to population growth. Actually, very late. Uh, agriculture developed rather late in Egypt. Because of the flood, they would find there would always be a lot of plants. So the, the gatherers were quite happy for quite a long time. Uh, to, they would be able to gather a lot of food. And in comparison with Levant, for example, the fertile, the fertile crescent, as, uh, uh, Dr. Breasted, James Henry Breasted had uh, defined uh, around 8,000 or something like that BC. In Egypt, it's only a, uh, around 5,500 5, BC, so much later. So they did, because it was such a, I guess, rich area, why? Because, and I'm sure you've heard that, uh, rich area when it comes to uh, wild plants, it would be refill, refreshed every, every year. So that's what we assume. That's why they did not have agriculture earlier that we know of earlier than that. We have evidence for like silos, which mean that they were probably gathering grain and, and uh, uh, growing it themselves only around 5500 BC, around the Fayum area. So not even around the Nile Valley. But sorry, I ruined your... <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this alters the question to, to some degree. But at, at some point, whether it be yeah. before the emergence of agriculture per se, but the uh, food wealth enabled by the flooding of the Nile, yeah. both before and after the rise of agriculture, surely led to growing populations, yeah. which would demand uh, more and more energy, whether in the form yeah. of charcoal, uh, crops produced to feed humans and animals, dung you also mentioned, so on and so forth. So I am curious to hear, historically speaking, how Egyptians responded to growing demands on resources, including energy resources, if and when uh, populations expanded. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting 
question. We, are, we never have very good idea how big the population was. It probably was a few millions for quite a long time. Uh, but it's, it's clear, though, that as, uh, as the population grew, there was still enough... Well, it's, what's interesting and what's hard to conceive now that now every, every little parcel of land is used. They have to find more. But there was a time where actually you still had land between villages. So as the population grew, you could go and get a couple more fields because it was still available. Uh, what happened when they, they, they did try, though, to uh, improve the irrigation system in some part, like the Fayum, which I mentioned, which is that oasis that you see quite clearly, I guess. I could show it to you instead of just talking about it. Mm. Mm -mm. Uh, they, we do have evidence of uh, special uh, programs being uh, organized to improve the drainage of that area. So the Fayum is right here. Uh, and during the Middle Kingdom, let's say 2000 BC or so, and then especially the Ptolemaic period when the Greek came, there was a lot of, of a huge effort made to drain some other land there and to to make it more uh, to to be able to make it into agricultural fields. So there was definitely an, uh, it was obvious that there was a need for more land, but it was not as drastic as it is today. When it comes to fuel. Uh, I think it, well, that's something I, I have not looked so much into it, and I don't think people have either. We, we need more PhD students, I guess, to, fo to focus on the question, which is I mean, the good news. So for those of you who have students saying, oh, I would love to do Egyptology, perhaps it's a good idea because there are questions that are unanswered. Um, I couldn't find a lot of information about it. So I would say they probably had to make use of what they had. So I think I didn't see it. Some of the basic stuff, probably a lot of the straw was used for fuel as well. Uh, it's obviously not mentioned because this was just everyday stuff. Uh, wood, I would not be surprised, was also more common than we think it is. The, the uh, Egypt, the Nile Valley looked very different. Uh, you would have along actually the, Nile, the desert, which is not something when I first started I, I had uh, thought about. But at the very edge of the desert, there was actually because of the of the topography, there was waters that might have been uh, because it, the, the the it was the land was uh, the surface of the. The ground, I guess, was closer to the uh, groundwater. There seemed to have been some seepage along the Nile Valley where water could come, th come through and where plants would grow, and it might have been lasting all year long, so there would have been vegetation there. When, on the other hand, all along the Nile, you would not have trees. It would be covered by, by the flood every year, so you wouldn't have enough time uh, for, for trees to grow. It would have looked very, very different from now. There's lots of, pl of plants along the Nile now, but that would not have been able to grow. That would have been more sandy, sandy uh, 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 shores. So I think they might have been, were, was it gr growing fast enough for it to be replenished? Did they use everything they had at their disposal? For fuel, I cannot help but be wondering because I don't see them ex importing just f timber for for fuel. But I, we also know that they didn't waste it because there, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of organic material have survived. Uh, boats, in particular, have actually uh, been uh, discovered. Um, remnants of boats and boats were usually made in pieces, so you would uh, they they would dismantle them. We have found them actually in several places in pieces. They would dismantle them uh, and just keep them in storage, essentially, and then put it back together when they needed it. And uh, we know that they reused a lot of the wood. So they would, uh, even though it might have been damaged a little bit, but they would do whatever, put some sort of repairs on it. So they didn't waste wood at all. Uh, but at the same time, they used a lot. So I don't have, I don't have, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I'm not really answering anything. <laughs> So I'm not exactly sure, uh, because in, in, a, in an article I read, it is true that the idea of, of uh, to be able to, uh, to, to be aware uh, that the resources will not last forever, it's actually something that's a very new thought. People would say, like, just a passenger pigeon, pigeon or whatever, they were billions, so let's just shoot galore, and eventually you reach an end where there are no more. And I think it's rather new for us to think, okay, if I use so much of it, eventually it will not have a chance to reproduce or it will not be able to be replenished. Uh, and there has been plenty of examples of people using their resources to the extreme, so I think I would, I would be curious to know, uh, the farming community knew their surrounding very well, but did they think of it that way, or did you just think yearly, like, oh, I knew my grandfather, this or that? I, I, that's something I, I, 
I take for granted sometimes because I happen to be at a university and I hear all those wonderful topics, but I do, I'm not exactly sure people who live closer to the land. Actually, I'm coming from the countryside in, in Brittany, and it's always interesting for me to see that people are not necessarily that knowledgeable about their environment. Uh, I'm a bird person, obviously, and I'm always curious. People don't know their birds, people don't know their plants, and I think, oh, but you guys work with your, or you don't, it's not what they're interested, what important for them at that point is producing whatever. Doesn't mean they're not interested, but they don't have the time perhaps to focus on it, or I'm not sure. You wanted to say something? Yeah. Well, making the connection of birds and the trees. Birds and the trees. So if you studied birds, are these prairie birds, or do they need trees to live? That's a very good question. Actually, Egypt is very interesting when it comes to the bird population. Uh, being located, it's located on a migration flyway, so a lot of the birds, there are very few uh, uh, endogenous uh, birds but that are specifically living all year long in Egypt. Uh, a lot of the birds that you will see are actually migratory birds or they will come for the winter and take advantage perhaps of the wetlands, especially the delta. Uh, uh, some of the birds are desert birds actually. You don't think all the time that, uh, that there is actually a lot of wildlife in the desert. They're just very much adapted and they hide very well so we don't see them necessarily but there is quite a bit of wildlife. Some of the birds are specialized for living in the desert. Uh, we do have birds that are uh, also found in, there's a lot of songbirds as well living in the Nile Valley uh, and water birds as well because you have the, the river. So that's mostly what you have. There is an area in the southern part which is interesting. The ostrich used to live, Rome, uh, the, which is also a savanna type bird rather, but there used to be much more vegetation pre essentially the emergence of the of the, the Egyptian state, but they still wandered around and we have evidence of them being around, but they still exist in Egypt. There is a location in the southeast corner actually of Egypt near the border with Sudan that has essentially a microclimate where you can still see ostriches supposedly in that area. Uh, but for the most part, uh, there is about 150 species that are indigenous to Egypt and uh, all 300 others are just coming through uh, so not so. It's mostly songbirds, little uh, little critters that you will find in the uh, the uh, uh, the rushes, the the reeds, and water birds. But so not so much. And rat birds are prey. But birds are prey are adaptable. They are. They some of them are. Yeah. And now the, the thing is, Egypt of today is very, uh, new birds are here now. Actually, if you get a chance to check the catalog of my exhibit, there is an article that's very interesting in the catalog about how the avifauna has changed since the flood, uh, the flood ended. And some species actually from Europe are now settling down when before they might stop by. And birds from also further south are coming up. Uh, so birds are adjusting differently. Some birds that the Egyptian would see everywhere, we don't see them. Uh, anymore, they're just further south. So uh, big switches, the, the birds are adjusting. Good way, bad way, it's always difficult to see depending on which bird you like or don't like. Or some people say, oh, I really like, I'm very happy that bird is here. Some others would say, damn, why is that dawn bird here? So any other questions? Is there anyone studying the pollen there? there yes, so now uh, I was able to, to find mostly, so they're interested in uh, the type of agriculture because actually uh, they are able to find grains, but they do pull, um, there is palynology, mm. I think it's called. So they are, they are people, this is what we call now microarchaeology, uh, and it's becoming more and more popular now. Well, the problem with Egypt is that you cannot take anything out of the country, even a uh, soil sample. So everything had to be done, has to be done there. And if you don't have any good equipment or if you cannot, you know, if you don't have somebody there who can do that type of work for you, it's always a challenge. But they, it's, or they will take the samples and hope to be able to study them at some point. But it is becoming more popular just to identify. So they are able to identify which type of trees, for example, were used for fuels. It's always unclear if it was wood that was used or charcoal, because I'm not sure how you identify but obviously the people were specialized. There's a special term for this type of study, but uh, yes, they do do that in, co in a, a soil core, like the, mm -hmm. to be able also to identify which type of trees was where at what time. Uh, so this is getting more and more popular actually, and uh, people are publishing more and more in that very uh, area. So botanical studies are becoming, uh, it's still, I would say there's still not a lot, and it's mostly about for the agriculture. Uh, the type of the type of 
uh, a plant that would have been grown rather, or the climate, climate studies, climate studies, not so much when it comes to energy on the type of fuel that might have been available. So, but it's definitely, I, it's definitely there. I was also wondering if anyone is focusing, you know, in terms of the fuel, since a lot of it was through labor and through beasts of burden. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone, you know, I started genetics with domestication of animals and you look at Egypt and you have so interesting. ferrets and you've got, you know, oxen and you've got domesticated palms. And I wonder whether we, we have this sort of focus, we want to think about burning things because this is what we know. What if they didn't in fact have more sort of simple machinery that allowed them to really develop using beasts of burden. Whereas mm. a lot of Africa, like Jared Diamond always teaches, well, Africa didn't develop so quickly because you can't domesticate a zebra, you know, forget a lion or giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> but for some true. reason, it seems like, you know, the oxen and their domesticated animals sort of stayed there. Why There really wasn't much obvious transport going on there. And he always talks about how Africa spans so many latitudes, it was, even the seeds themselves couldn't be distributed in the same way like That's you could across Europe and Asia. Is, is anyone focusing on maybe the beasts of burden really played more of a role than we think than burning even charcoal? That's an interesting point. I, I know people have uh, looked into, cattle was a huge commodity. Uh, people, as they called their animals by name, so we have records of uh, some cows being called ruru, being sold, and they tell you what color. So they were very special, and not necessarily a lot of people were able to afford it. I wouldn't be surprised in a village that was a shared commodity, like uh, there would be uh, a set of, of uh, oxen that people could use to plow. Uh, it's, it's, we have documents, and actually somebody from the university here, and I have not looked into that uh, in particular, uh, they, he has studied uh, the cell documents from the later period of history when we have more, uh, actually the more written records for more basic text like cells of uh, a donkey, cell of a cow. Well, we have actually quite a bit of those and I don't know if he has focused, I can't remember if he focused mostly the attention of just identifying how much it would cost or who would own those type of, uh, of how many they might have been in a village. It's, um, that's that would be very interesting, actually, to uh, to look more into it. We do have enough document on donkeys and and cattle to that they were definitely very important uh, animals that were valued because of the work that they provided in the community. Um, but uh, oh, this is also, is that it has brought a lot. Of, it has really been fascinating for me to focus a little bit more on that aspect of ancient Egypt, and I was just. Uh, frustrated when I was doing my research to see that there are all those wonderful questions that you guys ask. People are not necessarily interested in that so much. Uh, and it, it will need to be addressed at some point because you're right, domestication in Egypt is very interesting. Cattle might have been domesticated locally as well, while the other, the bird, the goose, it's important, the goose was domesticated in Egypt. Uh, so what you see in your, in your farmyard nowadays might have started in Egypt. But the uh, donkeys and all those animals came from the Levant. So the sheep, the goat. Uh, so they had all those as well, but they used sheep mostly for, uh, they didn't use wool, so that was mostly for, actually I'm not even sure, because we don't hear a lot. I guess food, most just food. And goats as well, that they used uh, for uh, cleaning up. Uh, like we use goats, they eat anything. So if you need goats to clean up an area, they, you put a goat and it's gone after that. They're selective sometimes. There are things they don't like, but for the most part. Yeah. Just as a, a, a very quick aside on the question of beasts of burden, it brought to my mind the fact that the common measure of motive power is in fact a horsepower. And although I think of horsepower as to talk about how strong the engineer Camaro might be, in fact, it derives from the fact that it was a horse, a beast of burden. Yeah, for the longest time. I mean, if you had to travel somewhere, you would have to go horse carriage uh, before you travel. So, Where is the Levant? Oh, sorry. That's, that's a terrible. When we, we talk about it so much that there's some everybody knows. This is Syria, Palestine. So it's right here. Sorry about that. 
I, I, typical, when we talk about it all the time, it's just, well, it must be, I don't know, well-known, <laughs> well-known fact. So, sorry. Uh, any other question? I apologize because I realize there are a lot of questions I cannot answer. They just uh, see this just type of question that you need to talk about with your student. Perhaps if they everybody studies a little bit of something, you'll get to a good answer at the end. Uh, you wanted to ask something? Yeah, I have a question. You mentioned dung really briefly, and I was just curious if uh, if what? you knew it dung. And dung, I was just yes. curious if you knew if that was something that was um, like local to households. Was it being used for cooking? Was it produced? I think they would they would use it for like in the house as well for uh, for they would the houses in uh, in ancient Egypt were very interesting because like even when I was growing up, I remember some of the farms. Everybody was living together. The cows were not very much. You could see the cows next 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 to you. There was no real division. So it was the same for some of the houses. In uh, I remember some of the houses in Elephantine. Uh, which is an island uh, in the southern part of Egypt, where it looks as if all the animals had to go through the living quarters to get to their to the stable. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they, they would gather all those good things and uh, just eventually put them to dry and use that as cooking fuel at home. I, I, we, it's still work in progress. We have not found a lot of settlements, unfortunately. A lot of what we know of ancient Egypt is those wonderful monuments in stone, but that's temples and, and tombs for the most part. The settlements were built along the Nile Valley, as I showed you, and would have been or underneath the cities or places of where people live today, uh, or have been washed out by the flood. So we do not have a lot of settlement archaeology, and it's always the same. When in, uh, people are selective, I, I'm very interested in um, uh, bones, for example, of animals that people would be consuming. So they usually will keep bones for big mammals, like if you eat beef or if you eat sheep, but not birds. So it's very hard actually for me to figure out what type of birds people would consume. And I think it would be the same when it comes to the ashes that were recovered, because we do find, they do find ashes in some areas and you say, oh yeah, this, there are ashes there, so that's where they were baking their bread but they don't necessarily take samples. So it's not always very clear to know what was used, but we know, for example, that they did use dung uh, <clears throat> for some of the kitchens in, uh, or from the bath, because they did studies of the remains of ashes, and they say, ooh, that's probably something that uh, was actually food, uh, uh, veggies that had been consumed at some point, so that must have been, they must have used dung. Uh, but still work in progress again. But I wouldn't be surprised if he used it more than we think because they had all those uh, ungulate, those, those vegetarian, uh, how do you call those type of animals? Um, uh, herbivores, thank you. <laughs> Roaming around, uh, you know, domesticated. So why not take advantage of those resources if you don't have a lot of wood close by? So I would, I would not be surprised. And don't they still do that in Egypt today anyway? Oh, in, uh, in Africa, I think they use a lot of that today. So, sorry. Time to go, perhaps? Uh, yes, but let us <laughs> first thank uh, Roseanne Barrier-Lesseur for this great presentation. Thank you.